This conference is brought to you by Callstack, your React and React Native development experts. I'm here to talk to you guys about developing applications at scale and federating them across your organization. Uh, so as I was introduced, my name is Zach Chappell. I'm actually the CEO and co-founder of a company called Zephyr Cloud. Um, huge background in uh, enterprise development and architecture, so I've been around for a little bit um, doing all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, but I'm here to take you all on a journey today. There we go. Okay, so when you have a big family like mine, I got four kids. I was talking to Nestor earlier. I'm pretty good at uh, spawning different processes. Um, but you need to be able to work together as a family. Um, but you also need to be able to do that inside of an organization too because as we know, we have to see these people eight hours a day, every single day, and we need to be able to work together. But what do you do when you actually have an idea for an application? Right? We all get ideas that one thing that gets us awake every night and that we want to work on ourselves. And, you know, we talked about there's 10 years of React Native now. There's all kinds of different tools that we can use to generate applications. You can use Rock, you can use Expo, you can use React Native uh, uh, Community CLI. There's a lot of different ways to generate applications. But, you know, today's the day of vibes. We saw lots of different ways to vibe applications. You can use something like Rourke, you can use Claude. Um, I saw the other day that Claude code actually works inside of Xcode now, not that anyone here would ever use that with React Native. Um, but you go through all of that work, you generate your application, and you finally ship. That's going to be awesome, right? But you get popular. That's a good thing. You think you're winning. The application's getting downloaded a bunch of different times. People are giving you good feedback. And yesterday, Jorge said that they're going to be releasing a new version every two months. So you know you're going to have to update your React Native application a little bit. And you realize that there's things that like updates, right? So you decide, hey, you know what? It's easy. I just go update a couple package JSON files. I'm going to go maybe change eight or nine files like we heard about the promise of. I think it's a little bit more than that right now, right? Um, but you haven't rolled your own OTA like Adam talked about earlier today, right? Because we all know that that's fun. There's a couple solutions out there. One that just got uh, deprecated, but we'll talk about that in a second. But you shipped that update, you went through all of that trouble, and now you have to wait for the Apple App Store to actually go and review it. Which, if you're like me, someone else actually claimed our company's um, Zephyr Cloud Apple iTunes account. So I had to send them our incorporation documents and all kinds of craziness just to prove that I was the CEO of the company. So that was kind of fun. Um, but they do eventually approve it. And now your users are saying, I want more features, right? Because we all have people who want new things. They want us to work on the application a little bit more and grow it. And that's great. Um, so you scale your team. Right? You start hiring more developers, you start um, finding people that can work on React Native, love your code base, love the things that you're doing, maybe even hire some people from Callstack. But then someone breaks the application. Um, I don't know if you, about, about you all, but um, I actually interviewed for a company one time and they said, we don't do TDD here. Okay, what do you do? He's like, we do SDD. I never heard of that before. He said, it's shame-driven development. You break the build, we shame you. So just like that, poof, your vacation's over. You have to go ship this new application. Someone broke it in production. That's great. And partial rollbacks are a thing, right? They're not, right? So you break the application. You think you can roll back part of it. It's like the web. You can't. But what can we learn from other parts of the platform? So one of the things that we know is that other parts of the web, they want to be able to ship faster too. But React Native is kind of a monolith right now. So how do we get through that? We actually saw this exact same journey happen for the backend, right? So anyone who's been doing backend developments for a while, they know that most backends were for a long time monoliths, right? Then we got these amazing things called microservices, right? Microservices are going to fix all of our problems. We're going to decompose every single application. It's going to be great. That lasted for about five seconds. Then we needed Docker because Docker is going to solve all of our problems, all these compatibility issues that we were having with microservices. We're going to containerize everything. 
That's going to solve every single problem we have because now it's going to be easy. It's like little raviolis of code, and we'll be able to move them everywhere. But then that became a mess, so we needed Kubernetes, right? So now once you have Kubernetes, great. Now I can do all kinds of amazing things. I can deploy to all these clouds. I think life is getting good. But then you have all these tools on top of Kubernetes that you actually need to be able to do something at scale. So you can see that this pain just kept getting worse and worse, but it, we started to create tools that could solve it. But this is React Universe. What about that kind of evolution for the front end? OK, great. The front end went through the same thing. We said, OK, great. Let's decompose our applications in the micro front ends. We can separate each one of our teams. And we can say, you know, you're the inspiration team. You're the search team. You're going to be able to work on your whole stack. You could deploy independently. And everything is going to be awesome. And our first iteration of that was iframes, right? Hopefully, everyone here never had to deal with iframes, but you probably have. We also have them on React Native called WebViews. Um, so that's always kind of fun too, right? That led to something that I affectionately call resume-driven development. Because when everything is isolated and everyone can do whatever they want, you can work on that technology that you saw Theo tweet about last night, right? That's a problem. And the other problem is that there's something called Evergreen. You know, now that we're all iframes, we can ship independently and do whatever we want anytime. And Evergreen is fine, right? Like everything, everything's gonna be okay. But everything's on fire. Right? Because everyone's doing exactly what they want, when they want it, there's zero collaboration. So then we get the next bright idea. Let's use NPM. NPM has versioning, NPM has packages, it has all the things that we think we want, because now I can build, publish, and teams that are consuming me can decide when they, uh, that they take that update, and that's going to fix everything. Well, now not only is everything on fire, but I have to do 50 pull requests just to be able to fix it. Right? That's not fun, that's even worse, right? So there's this thing called module federation. Perhaps that will be the solution to our problem. Because it's like Docker, but for the front end. You can see from the uh, two screenshots I have here that Docker and module federation actually do share some similar things um, in terms of API structure. The things that I like to point out is that they talk a lot about what they consume and what they expose, what their dependencies are, what kind of things you're sharing. There's some really good similarities there. So if you're looking for a mental model, uh, it's a good thing to take a look at. And it started actually in Webpack. A lot of people, when they talk about module federation, they say Webpack module federation. Uh, funny to know about that, I learned it's always a lowercase w if you look at their brand guidelines. So I twitch every time I see someone putting a big W in there. But it's not just for Webpack, right? A lot of us loved what we were doing in module federation, but we didn't want to use Webpack anymore because it's slow, it's not getting very many updates, and we just feel stuck. So we actually worked with the RSPack team who has been using Module Federation for a really long time. And as soon as they open source, they're like, oh, great. Now, when do we get Module Federation working with this? Um, they said, sure, we'll work on it. And we actually released several versions of Module Federation. The first one was you know, 1.0, so you could do everything that you're doing today with Webpack Module Federation. And then there was a version called 1.5, which was kind of like our bridge version to introduce things that were called runtime hooks and a bunch of other stuff. Um, Funny story on that one, it was actually inspired by the Angular router. So we looked at the different lifecycle hooks, because you know, hopefully you all forgive me, I used to be an Angular developer. Um, but the router has some really cool hooks. You know, How do I know that I can actually resolve that route, start that? And so we moved to 2.0. And 2.0 is when we really started to have a lot of fun with RS Pack, And we actually started to adding things like Vite support. So uh, Giorgio is actually a member of our community. He added the first uh, community plugin for Vite. That was great. Um, and then Evan and his team added support for Rolldown. But this one's actually on hold because the Rolldown team, for those of you who don't know, is actually going through a re-architecture right now. So they're going to redo how they handle uh, module splitting. So we're not recommending that people move to Rolldown and RS Pack. I mean, R Rolldown and Module Federation right now because it's on hold. But there's an open GitHub issue for that. Um, that you all can track if you are itching to try roll down. But again, this is React Universe. I want to use Module Federation, but for React Native. Is Kuba in here? Kuba, are you hiding somewhere? Hey. Um, so Kuba actually worked on the first iteration of Module Federation with Repack back when it was still just in Webpack. 
right? So the first iteration was a thing, and they used it as part of something that they were calling the Super App Showcase. So if anyone's seen WeChat or something like that, it's a concept called Super Apps, where you can load additional applications into your app and be able to uh, share them and do all kinds of fun stuff. And so Kuba had the first iteration. We worked with him to do that and, and uh, upgrade that to Module Federation 2.0. Um, so that was really fun. Um, and Repack, we, we had a little fun with them. We actually brought them to one of our customers. I'll get to that in just a second. But um, it just worked, right? It was using Webpack. It was using RSPack. And Module Federation was native to those. So everything just worked. I think it's because of the magic that Kuba worked out for us. Um, but then we had a bunch of people saying, hey, I don't want to use Repack. No offense to Repack, but I just want to use Metro. It's what's default with React Native. That's what I'd like to use. And say, that's your choice. You can do what you want to. It's like Burger King. Um, so we talked to Rob and the, and the call stack team. And we actually worked together to figure out, OK, how are we going to land some of the things that we need for module federation into Metro? And actually, yesterday, while we were sitting in the front row here, we merged the pull request to actually make module federation Metro part of module federation core itself. Um, so we merged that pull request yesterday. Yeah, one of my uh, platform engineers, Nestor, in the front here is, it was, is having all kinds of fun with that right now. Um, the documentation is going to land in the documentation site pretty soon, too, but we're translating it to Chinese. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Module Federation team um, has a good uh, contingent at ByteDance, so they translate all of our documents to Chinese as well. So that's a lot of fun. OK. So how big is it, right? So we saw some different packages that were on stage throughout the last couple of days, and they talked about downloads. And Module Federation is probably one of the biggest packages that most people in this room have ever heard of. 16 million downloads just in August, right? We're about to cross 4 million downloads a week. That's bigger than some web frameworks. Um, not to throw shade at my previous web framework. Um, but that's pretty cool. So we, we didn't know exactly how big it was until we actually extracted it from Webpack. Because a lot of our downloads were being hidden because it was just a built-in feature of Webpack. So once we extracted it, now we can start to see all the downloads that are accumulating. And still, this isn't accounting for all the people that are using 1.0. So a lot of the organizations that are using Module Federation aren't even counted in this yet. right? And that's not counting all the people that are probably going to start using it after this talk because it works with Metro now. And it's not just small organizations. So in the last three years, we've actually been consulting with a bunch of different companies on Module Federation. And this is just a subset of those logos. Almost the entire Fortune 500 uses Module Federation in some way. That's a pretty big deal. And there's a lot of faces behind it, too. So you see um, some people from AWS. You see people from ByteDance, someone who's now currently at Vercel, um, and a lot of really fun people who have been working on Module Federation with us. Kuba, I put you on there this, uh, on this slide, too. Um, had to show you some love for that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot, quite a few of us that are actually involved in Module Federation. So what that means is shipping super apps is actually kind of easy now, right? And you could do it real world at scale because you can actually decompose your applications. It also will allow you to decouple from the App Store, which is one of the things that people talk about when they talk about over the air updates. And there is EAS and rest in peace code push, but um, those are a couple different solutions. But what we found so far is that right now, those um, are both monolithic solutions. I know Adam talked a little bit earlier about decomposing those updates and just shipping the difference in bytecode. But what we're evangelizing for is decomposing it even more on a module level. So now the teams can begin to decompose what they are shipping and be able to version them independently and ship independently on your own infrastructure. And what that means is that, in, that you can ignore this completely ugly application um, but what that means is that you can have two completely different teams at two completely different development velocities be able to ship because of how easy it is to configure this with module federation. And it literally looks like that. You just define what these remotes are, and these remotes are basically mini apps that live in your application. And the URL actually can point to anything from a S3 bucket to your CDN or to your local host, and you can configure things like that. And the manifest is the resolution of the files that are going to be um, loaded by React Native. It's kind of interesting, right? Because now, if you're trying to ship something new, 
All you have to do is update what's on that bucket, right? And the runtime hooks that are part of module federation are able to load that code for you and be able to bootstrap it into the application. So Adam's going to have all kinds of fun refactoring all the stuff that he was working on um, once he starts using module federation because a lot of the, the, the pain just goes away. So you think it's successful, right? Super apps are now actually going to be easy. But how many people have more than one environment? Yeah, pretty much everybody, right? You don't even raise your hand for that because we have a customer that has seven environments that they have to go through. Rest in peace to those developers. But every single time you go through an environment, that's a different URL, right? Most people separate their environments by their CDN buckets or they separate their environments by different directories on their CDN. And that becomes painful. And you think about, well, I've already decomposed these applications. How in the world am I going to develop with this? And that's what happens, and you end up with configurations like this, right? Because you have all these teams that now need to be able to develop independently and be able to build things independently and all these different environments, so you have this complete bloat of configuration files, and it works. But if you're an organization like uh, a giant e-com that we know, they actually had 250 lines of module federation config that they were going to comment different things out of, depending on what environment they're in. And that, doesn't exactly sound maintainable to me. And things happen, right? I need to be able to roll back. And right now, most of these organizations, what they're doing is rolling back by rerunning their previous GitHub action because I've hard-coded that URL into an environment that's going to an S3 bucket, and the only way that I can repopulate that S3 bucket is to run the GitHub action again, right? It's one of the problems of evergreen development. And that's where we get to in some of the fun stuff that Nestor and I are working on. Because what we've done is we've created an organization called Zephyr that takes all of that module federation config and just handles it for you. So now you can treat it like NPM. You can follow it like an environment, like staging or a tag. You can follow a specific version. And what that allows you to do is be able to pin it. So now you don't have to worry about any of those environments and any of those configurations before uh, that you had to before. And what's really fun is that um, kind of like how what Adam was talking about where they ship just the diff, we do that, but shipping directly to the edge. So this is actually a screenshot I took yesterday deploying our React Native application that you saw on an earlier slide. And changing that to red and then doing a build, it took 260 milliseconds to deploy it to the edge. So that means every single user that was on that application was able to get that update in 260 milliseconds. So that's, that's pretty fun. Um, and it was all running on our Cloudflare infrastructure, so that was kind of fun, too. Um, and we have a really easy way to be able to roll back, too. Um, just a couple of clicks to be able to roll back, too. So you, you can look at each of those individual applications and begin to roll them back uh, really easy. And the big thing is, like, being able to deploy to your own cloud, right? So, like, the nice thing about module federation is it's decoupled you from everyone else's infrastructure, right? So, if you use module federation by itself, don't care anything about what we're doing with Zephyr, you can actually go ahead and do something very similar to this yourself, right? You can deploy to Cloudflare, you can deploy to AWS, it doesn't matter wh which cloud you're on, you can deploy module federation with React Native. If you're interested to know how that, that impacts an organization, though, go take a peek at this, this case study. Um, we went down to Southern Glazers Wine and Spirits, which is a $26 billion liquor distributor. Their releases took about two months to go through their different environments. And after we introduced Module Federation, we actually brought CallStack on site for a week, and we took them from that to being able to deploy their mobile application sub-second in a week. That was just with Repack um, and Module Federation, so that was a lot of fun. And what that means now, though, is that they're able to test things in the field significantly faster. There's all these new testing tools that are coming out. You want to be able to do some matrix testing of different versions of your micro front ends or your mini apps inside of React Native. You can now do that with that module federation config, right? So you can begin to swap things at the testing level and have a lot of fun. Uh, so now the only thing left to do is to figure out what you can do with React Native, Module Federation, Zephyr Cloud, and you. Thank you very much. <laughs>